David Maitis has dedicated his career to exposing and ending human rights abuse. That's not an easy thing to do when you think about it. To face these horrible crimes, to hear and give voice to countless victims, and to seek justice against the perpetrators, especially on a daily basis, not an easy thing to do. We interviewed David in our film, Hard to Believe, and today we'll be asking him what keeps him going forward against these seemingly impossible criminals, how the recent pandemic is affecting his work and the state of forced organ harvesting by the Chinese regime today. Thank you, David. Well, thank you for inviting me. With this lockdown, what are you able to uh, keep keep working on? Well, uh, human rights issues continue. Uh, the uh, A lot of them now are related to COVID-19. It's uh, I do a lot of immigration and refugee work, and <clears throat> there's a lot of um, problems and concerns about refugees because they're in close quarters in uh, camps that could easily become uh, pools of infection. Of course. Sure, it's a problem. I mean, these camps are not ideal in, in the best of times, but uh, the uh, minimal services they provide, the close quarters, the poor health care, uh, becomes even more acute in a time like this. Let's look at China. What are you seeing with the way uh, uh, the Chinese regime has been responding to to uh, the outbreak? Over the course of 14 years, I, I, I see a pattern, and uh, I see... Uh, behavior by the Chinese Communist Party that just replicates itself. Uh, and although, I mean, the virus itself is new, the, the Communist Chinese Party reaction to it is not new. It's it's the same way they reacted to uh, organ harvesting. It's uh, disinformation, denial, cover-up, uh, repression, uh, counter-narrative, uh, the pressuring international institutions and partners to uh, go along with uh, their political agenda, putting the interests of the Communist Party above the public interest, and, and so on. To a certain extent, I, I feel that through COVID-19, uh, we're paying the, the price for this lack of attention to uh, or organ transplant abuse because if, if uh, people knew the, and, and been sensitized to the way this is the way the Communist Party reacts, it, they would have picked up immediately what the problem is when they heard news of the virus rather than, mm. which frankly Taiwan did and New Zealand did and uh, Korea did and uh, Hong Kong did and Singapore did because they, they're fam much more familiar with, with the way the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party operates in the rest of the world. The Chinese Communist Party is definitely a problem, but our own inattention to the problem creates a secondary problem, and, and we've all become victimized by the secondary problem. What would you say to people who are not still not aware of that secondary problem as such? You know, with the organ harvesting and transplant abuse, they still say it isn't happening. But with the coronavirus, they can no longer say it's... It, it, it's not there. It's not happening. You're all making it up. It's it's anti-China and so on. I mean, it's it's obvious. So that and they themselves have admitted uh, that there is the virus, uh, belatedly, unfortunately. But uh, the result is that the, the cover-up looks just ham-handed. A similar dynamic with SARS. I mean, initially they they tried the same thing with SARS cover-up denial and so on, uh, and and then it was uh, obvious that it was happening and they flipped uh, uh, on it. And and I, I think that what happens is that people are more aware, but I, I'm not, it's not clear to me that people see the pattern all this. It's, it, well, I mean, I'm in Winnipeg and in Winnipeg, we've got some rivers and they flood every year. And every year when they flood, there people are surprised the rivers flood. <laughs> and uh, oh, really? so there's this, uh, a kind of institutional memory that uh, leads people, even when they know how the Communist Party reacts, to turn it to the next uh, the next uh, crisis. Mm. So the rivers are flooding and people aren't seeing that in their own home. How do you then have people recognize that in a foreign country with a rather foreign system that they may not, uh, people here may not even realize how far in that system really is. Well, the reality is it's it's not becoming easier over time. It's becoming more difficult because it, it, with SARS, uh, it, at one point, the World Health Organization uh, was prepared to condemn China for what they had done in terms of the cover-up. But I don't see that happening this time. China's become more powerful uh, and 
economically, politically, and throws its weight around more in international institutions. And 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 they've become more sophisticated in doing so. They they're, they're a lot more involved in picking the experts who are likely to issue the reports from the international institutions about the the the, uh, the coronavirus uh, epidemic, and so that these handpicked uh, Chinese experts uh, or handpicked by the Chinese experts are are much less likely to uh, give an independent view of what the communist Chinese have done here. These people doing reports, are they being complicit? Are they repeating that uh, propaganda as, as, as such, or are they creating their own form of it? What you will hear from the World Health Organization is is not when we criticize China that we're being uh, anti-Chinese, which is what the Communist Party would say. Mm-hmm. What we would, what they would say when we're criticizing China is you're being political, uh, mm-hmm. meaning that the independent experts are political and the people who are really politicians are not political. Uh, the so it's a kind of shift <laughs> in vocabulary, but okay. it, it amounts to the same thing. It sounds like a bit of a semantic game. That, that, that's what I find researching that, how the the Chinese regime operates and, and trying to understand their euphemisms and things like that. What would be some advice you might give to people that are actually willing to try and see through their, their, their veil of propaganda? With organ harvesting, it was perhaps easy to ignore because the uh, people who were the victims uh, were all within China. Uh, and uh, people felt, well... I. You know, this isn't happening to me, and so I can ignore it. But with coronavirus, believing in China has become its own punishment. It's put the people who believed in the Chinese communists at risk. It's a gruesome way of teaching a lesson, but it's, it, 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 uh, I, I think we have to make clear the lesson that's being taught from it and learn from it. Even with the COVID crisis, what signs are you seeing that uh, this the, the practice of forced organ harvesting is still continuing? Organ harvesting is is institutionalized. It's built into the health system, uh, and it finances the health system. It's the primary mm-hmm. source of funds for the health system. Stopping organ harvesting of prisoners of conscience uh, would would mean a fina- financial collapse of a lot of the health institutions. So you're saying unless unless they stop persecuting or they are willing to give up, however many millions or billions of dollars, then this this uh, practice is still continuing. Well, there's no sign of it. In fact. The organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners was uh, sourcing from a, a, a vast prisoner population, but uh, which uh, was not being replenished as, as it was being depleted through organ harvesting. And what we've seen with the depletion of, of the Falun Gong pool is a, a replacement and increase of the Uyghur pool. If, as in the West, we hadn't turned such a blind eye to what was going on with the mass organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners, that the that we wouldn't be seeing what's happening with the Uyghurs right now. Oh, uh, a- absolutely. We see uh, Uyghurs personally being shipped around China. We see we Uyghur organs moved uh, uh, out of Xinjiang. They have in a few airports in Xinjiang now. Uh, special express lanes for the uh, the shipment out of organs like organs or, or people organs still within people what what exactly does do you think that means no uh, no the, no the, the transshipment uh, is is for organs okay. not for people uh but people are being moved out too but that that the special lanes are not for that what you've got with china is is uh the uh, communists is, is progressive cover-up uh that as soon as uh, any data is disclosed, uh, they shut it down. Uh, together, what's happened means constantly looking for new, new data strands, new trails of evidence, and and they are uh, available. But it's it's a constant uh, cat and mouse game, so to speak. Oh, it's just awful. It's just awful when you know thinking thinking about this. Um, you said you mentioned cat and mouse game, and and it's it's just it just feels like. Uh, you know, taking a step back and looking at the issue and, and realizing we're actually talking about human beings here and these are uh, human organs being put through these fast transplant lane in the airports with, you know, special airports, with new airports with special lanes just for the organs and they're likely coming from an innocent person that's been killed by the regime and someone's paying a lot of money for it on the other end, knowingly or unknowingly of, of where, where that's coming from and, and whether someone's, you know, someone's been killed for it. 
Do you do that sometimes? Do you take that step back or is that something that you maybe maybe try to avoid? Well, I mean, my starting point, I mean, what got me into human rights uh, in the first place was the Holocaust. Starting from that point, uh, I, I immediately, I mean, from the moment I began, I realized you're dealing with a bottomless pit of, uh, of, of inhumanity, the, that there's no level below which people can sink when it comes to committing human rights violations. And my, my own view is to be effective in this area, uh, I, I wouldn't call it desensitized, but I would call it professionalized. I see a lot of burnout in this area of dealing with human rights violations because people just get too horrified by it. Mm. Uh, and it is. I mean, it's this is not fun, but it's something that needs to be done. And, and uh, if it's going to be done effectively, it has to be done dispassionately. Does that help you uh, really look at people as, as human beings as opposed to this country, that country, this issue, that issue? Coming for, from the Holocaust and the Jewish community. I, I have in mind what uh, Rabbi Hillel said about uh, 2,000 years ago. He said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? If not, now when? Obviously, I'm concerned about uh, the uh, victimization of the Jewish community, but also uh, it's important to be uh, concerned about others that have nothing to do uh, with the Jewish community. And and so uh, I, I'm I'm looking for issues where I have no personal connection. And, and that's certainly the case with, with Falun Gong in China because I don't have any personal connection to it. And also, I'm looking at situations where victims can't speak for themselves. Like I'm involved in children's rights, for instance, mm. where uh, sexual abuse of children, and, and ch uh, especially cross-border sexual abuse of children. And, and I mean, the victims there really uh, are powerless. Uh, mm. And my attitude is, not everybody should do what I do, but everybody should do, uh, use whatever skills they had to get involved in the issue. I saw an art display of uh, a, uh, an artist, and what she did is she had a display of pandas, uh, stuffed pandas with stitches across them. Uh, to represent, I mean, the pandas representing China. And, Stitches, uh, as in like across the body or across the yes, eyes? Yes, across or, the body, yeah. Uh, as if organs had been removed? Exactly. I see. Okay, okay. Uh, and, I've got a picture. I mean, uh, of course, I never would have thought of that myself. <laughs> it was very effective, I thought. It was communicating to a au different audience, communicating in a different way, contributing to the issue, and... And, you know, she's a lot more effective in contributing to the issue doing that than doing what I'm doing. So uh, I think everybody can, should contribute in their own way doing what they normally do uh, on these various human rights issues. Human rights violations, unless they're combated, unless they stop, they spread. Uh, I mean, it's particularly graphic with COVID-19 because it's spreading quickly and it's spreading everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but uh, with organ harvesting, uh, it's it spread a lot more slowly, but it spread, uh, it spread to the Uyghurs and it spread to Xinjiang. Uh, and it would not have spread there if, if it had been stopped earlier, absolutely. Sounds, sounds like uh, you're talking about human rights abuse as being like a form of cancer or virus or something like that. Human rights violations in any one area can stop and be remedied. And I've seen that over the course of my career that, you know, I was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement and now it's gone. And I was involved in human rights within the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain and that's all gone. And the uh, security states of Latin America, they've all gone. But there's been new uh, new uh, violations, new violating regimes to pop up to take their place. But obviously you've got hope if uh, if you're still working on the issue and you see obviously it's, it's something that's worth to work on. So I really commend you on that. That's, uh, that's very inspiring. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think I've got more determination than hope. I'm, <laughs> I'm resigned to the situation where, I mean, in any one area, uh, human rights violations will disappear, but another will pop up. It's just that, as they say, uh, if we don't do this, it's going to get a lot worse. I think uh, we can't remove it, but we can make it better. If we don't do this, it's going to get a lot worse. Well, that's, that's yeah. certainly something that people are facing right now with the COVID-19 yeah, crisis. As we can see, yeah. Thank you so much, David. It's really a pleasure to speak with you. If you haven't read David Matus and David Kilgore's book, Bloody Harvest, there's a link to it below this video, and it's not a long read. If you're skeptical about the issue of forced organ harvesting, I challenge you to read it and assess the evidence for yourself. 
If you prefer to watch a movie, Hard to Believe is available for free online. There's also a link to that below and it's been translated into over 10 languages now, so please share it widely. Thank you for watching and thank you for not turning a blind eye to this issue. Till next time, stay safe and stay well.